Chapter 10 of The City at World's End by Edmund Hamilton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The City at World's End. Chapter 10 From the Stars. Keniston watched them come, the four vague figures walking slowly through the dawn toward New Middletown. His heart pounded and his mouth was dry, and he was strangely afraid. Perhaps it was the manner of their coming that made him so, the brooding, enigmatic bulk of that unknown ship, that long and cautious silence. It came to him that they too were doubtful. The three leading figures resolved themselves gradually into men, clad in slacks and jackets against the biting cold. The fourth member of the party trudged along some distance behind them a stocky form, veiled in the blowing dust. Mayor Garris said, wonderingly, "'They look just like us. I guess people haven't changed much after all in a billion years.' Keniston nodded. For some reason, the cold knot in the pit of his stomach would not relax. There was something overpowering in this incredible meeting of two epochs. He glanced at the others. Their faces were white and tense there was a feeling of excitement verging almost on hysteria. The strangers were close enough now to distinguish features. The stocky laggard remained indistinct, but of the three who came before, Keniston saw now that only two were men. The third was a blue-eyed woman, tall and lithe, with hair the color of pale gold, smooth-coiled about her head. Keniston was struck by her. He had seen more beautiful women but he had seldom seen one who carried herself with such grace and authority, and who looked at the world with such a direct, intelligent gaze. Almost instantly he resented her, for no more reason than that she made him instantly conscious of the vast horizons of knowledge and experience which were far beyond his present ken. And yet her mouth was friendly, quite a strong mouth, but ready to smile. The younger of the two men was broad and hard and healthy, with sorrel hair and one of those frank, jovial faces that is built over flint. Like the woman's, his attitude was of alert, half-cautious reserve. The other man was thin and untidy and very human. He had none of the cool reserve of his companions. He was excited and showed it, blinking eagerly at the Middletowners. Keniston warmed to him at once. There was a strange silence, and the woman and two men stopped. They looked at the Middletowners, and the Middletowners stared at them. Then the woman said something to her companions in a rapid, unfamiliar tongue. The younger man nodded silently, and the thin, eager man poured out a tumbling flood of words. Mayor Garris stepped forward hesitantly, a paradox of pompous humility. "'I,' he said, and stopped. The small word vanished away on the wind, and he could seem to find nothing to replace it. The blonde woman regarded him with her bright gaze, intent and faintly amused. The thin man stepped forward toward them. Forming the words very carefully, he said, "'Middletown calling!' and again, "'Middletown calling!' Keniston was shaken by a great amazement. Relief and understanding made him almost giddy for the moment, and he heard again his own tired voice speaking those two hopeless pleading words into a silence that neither heard nor answered. But it had heard. It had answered, from somewhere. From where? Another world? Another star? Not from anywhere on earth, surely. That great ship had never stooped to make such a paltry journey. He heard Mayor Garris utter a squeaking, strangled cry. A wave of shock, audible in the indrawn breath of every man there, swept the tight-packed group. Keniston's wandering thoughts came back with a start. The fourth member of the party had come up and joined the other three, and Keniston himself was appalled at what he saw. The fourth of the newcomers was not human. Manlike, yes but not a man. He was tall, his body enormously strong and massive, his thick arms ending in hands like heavy paws. 
he was clothed in his own shaggy fur, supplemented by a harness-like garment. His head was flattened, its muzzle protruding in the fashion of a beast, his round and tufted ears alert. And his eyes. It was the eyes that were most shocking. They met Keniston's, large and dark and full of a quick, penetrating intelligence. Good-natured eyes, curious, smiling. The mayor had backed away. His face was quite white. He cried out shrilly, "'Why, it isn't human!' The furry one looked puzzled by this outburst. He glanced at the woman and the two men, and they all looked at Garrus, frowning, as though at a loss to understand his fright. The creature moved toward Garrus a step or two, his paw-like hands outstretched. He spoke in a slow, rumbling voice and smiled, showing a row of great teeth that glistened sharp as sabers in the light. Garrus shrieked and Keniston saw panic on the faces of the other men and saw the guns come up. "'Wait!' he yelled, and darted forward, thrusting the mayor aside. "'For God's sake, wait, you fools!' He faced them, standing so that his body shielded the alien one. He had, himself, a revulsion from that creature that was both beast-like and man-like. But the furry one had looked at him and had smiled. "'Don't shoot!' he cried. It's intelligent! It's one of them!" "'Stand aside, Keniston!' shouted the mayor, his voice high with panic. "'The brute looks dangerous!' The guns he faced swung sharply away from Keniston. He turned and saw that the four newcomers had suddenly stepped a little to one side. And abruptly, the scene ended. The woman raised her hand in a swift gesture. From the ship out on the plain came a flash of white light. It struck like a snake at all the crowd of Middletowners in the portal. It struck and was gone in an instant. Keniston had been in its path, too. He felt a stunning shock in every nerve of his body. There was only a split second of pain and then a numbed paralysis as from an electric shock. He saw Garrus and Hubble and the others stagger, their faces white and shaken, the guns dropped from nerveless hands. Then the furry one trudged toward Keniston. Again his dark eyes smiled. He made reassuring rumbling sounds, and his big, paw-like hands kneaded into Keniston's neck with expert deafness. The paralysis of Keniston's nerves began to fade. The sorrel-haired younger man had stepped forward and picked up one of the fallen guns. Incredulity came into his eyes as he examined it. He said something in a sharp voice to the others. They looked the gun over and over. Then, puzzled and startled, they stared at Keniston and at the other Middletowners who now seemed returning to normal. "'They've got a death-ray or something,' choked Bertram Garris. "'They can kill us!' Hubble said savagely. "'Shut up! You're making an ass of yourself. That weapon was only a non-lethal means of defense that you forced them to use.' The woman called excitedly to the furry one. Gore Hall! It was, obviously, his name. And Gore Hall rejoined the other three. He too uttered sounds of bewilderment as he looked at the gun. Keniston spoke to Hubble, ignoring Garrus and the dazed police. I think they've just begun to suspect where we came from. The excitement of the four newcomers was obvious. It was the woman, Keniston noticed, who first recovered from that bewilderment. She spoke quickly to the thin, blinking man, the one who had so happily repeated, Middletown Calling. From her repeated use of the name, Keniston guessed the man was called Piers Eglin. And Piers Eglin looked the most staggered of all the four, and the most joyful. He came back to Keniston. He almost devoured him with those blinking eyes. Middletown, he said and then, after a moment, friends. Keniston seized on that. Friends? Then you speak English? The word English set Piers Eglin off into a new paroxysm of excitement. He began to babble to the others, but the woman cut him short. He swung back to Keniston. English! Language! He almost panted. 
You speak English language." Keniston simply nodded. A look of awe crept into Piers Eglin's blinking eyes as he asked, "'Who? No!' He began again. "'Where do you come from?' "'From the past,' Keniston answered, and felt the full unreality of it as he said it. "'From far in the past.' "'How far?' Keniston realized that twentieth-century dates would mean little after all these epochs. He thought for a moment, then he said, "'Very far in the past. In our lifetime, atomic power was first released.' "'So far!' whispered Piers Eglin numbly. "'But how? How?' Keniston shrugged helplessly. "'There was an atomic explosion over our city. We found our whole city in this age. That's all." The thin man feverishly translated for the others. The woman showed deep interest. But it was Gore Hall, the furry one, who made the longest comment in his rumbling voice. Piers Eglin swung back to Keniston, but Keniston stemmed the other's eager questions by a question of his own. "'Where do you come from?' The thin one pointed up at the dawn-lit sky. From, he seemed trying to remember the ancient name, then, from Vega. It was Keniston's turn to be staggered. But you're Earthmen! He pointed to Gore Hall's furry figure. And what about him? Again, Piers Eglin seemed to search his memory for a name. Then he said it. Capella. Gore Hall is from Capella. There was a silence in which the four looked at the men of Middletown. Keniston's mind was a chaotic whirl, out of which one thing stood clear. The televisor radio of this domed city had indeed been far outside his comprehension. That radio had been designed for interstellar distances. That was where the call had gone and whence it had been answered. From Vega, from Capella, from the stars. But you speak our old language!" he cried incredulously. Piers Eglin stumblingly explained, I am an historian, specializing in the pre-atomic Earth civilization. I learned its language from the old records. That is why I asked to leave to accompany this party to Earth. The woman interrupted. She was shivering a little, and she spoke now in a low, rapid voice. Piers Eglin told them. She is Varn Allen, the administrator of this... this sector. Here, nodding to the sorrel-haired younger man, is Norden Lund, the sub-administrator. The words were hard for him to remember, harder still to shape. He added, Varn Allen asks that we... we talk inside the city, where it is not so cold. Keniston had guessed that the woman held authority in the group. He was not surprised. Her vibrant forcefulness was striking. Mayor Garris, who was half frozen himself, was only too happy to accede to that request. He turned toward the portal, behind which all the thousands of New Middletown were being held with difficulty. Their massed faces showed as a pale blur through the glass of the dome. "'Make way there!' Garris ordered, in his most important tone. He gestured at the sweating guardsmen and police who held the line. "'Clear away there now, we're coming in!' He raised his voice, speaking to the people beyond. "'Stand back, will you? Everything's fine. The other people have come at last, and they want to see our city. So let them through, let them through!' The crowd, with painful reluctance, made a narrow lane through itself which was widened by the efforts of the guardsmen. Leading the way for the starfolk, the mayor's dignity was somewhat injured by the uneasiness that caused him to skip hastily ahead with nervous backward glances at Gore Hall's towering figure. But he kept up his jovial front as leader of his people, shouting to them that all was well, that there was nothing to fear, and begging them to keep back and refrain from pushing. Varn Allen was the first one to follow Garris through the portal. 
She hesitated, just an instant, as she and the jostling eager crowd caught sight of one another, and the crowd sent up a wild-throated roar of cheering that shook the dome. Behind her, Norden Lund grinned and shook his head, as a man might at the bad manners of children. Then Varn Allen smiled at the people and went on, and the edges of the crowd swayed and buckled inward, and the guardsmen swore, and some irreverent soul whistled appreciatively at the tall, lithe woman with the golden hair. They shouted questions at her, a thousand all at once, and the half-hysterical greetings of people who have waited so long that they have lost hope, and then find it suddenly fulfilled, and Keniston hoped that they would not do anything violent, like carrying her and Norden Lund on their shoulders. He went in right beside Gore Hall. The people had not seen him yet, except as a vague, dark figure beyond the wall of curving glass. When they did, their voice dropped dead still for a moment, and then took up again on a rising note of incredulity and alarm. Women who had shoved and clawed to get in the first row now tried to scramble back out of harm's way, and the edges of the crowd drew sharply apart. Keniston walked close to the big furry capellan, his hand resting on one mighty shoulder, to show the crowd that they had nothing to fear. And the people stared and stared. "'What the devil is it? A pet? Look, it's got clothes on. Don't tell me it's one of them.' "'Keep it away from me. It's showing its teeth.' Keniston shouted explanations, and under his palm the dark thick fur was hot and alien, and he was almost as much afraid of Gore Hall as they were. And then, from out of the crowd, a tiny girl came toddling directly into their path. Her eyes shining with childish glee, she ran toward Gore Hall's mighty furry form. "'Teddy Bear!' she shrieked joyfully. "'Teddy Bear!' and she flung her arms around his leg. Gore Hall uttered a rumbling laugh. He reached down with his great paw to pat her head, and other children came running, breaking away from fearful mothers, clustering eagerly around the big capellan as he trudged along. The little girl he hoisted to his shoulder, and she rode there clinging to his ears, and after that it was impossible for anyone to fear him. The tension of the crowd relaxed, and they grinned at each other and laughed. Sure, it's a pet. Hey, how do you like that? Walking on his hind legs just like a man. Smart, ain't he? Why, you'd almost think he was trying to talk. Piers Eglin, who must have caught at least a part of this, peered sidelong at Gore Hall, but he did not offer to translate. The crowd became a fluid mass flowing along the boulevards, following the strangers. Help and hope and companionship had come at last to New Middletown and the relief and joy in the faces of the people were wonderful to see. But Keniston watched the faces of the blue-eyed woman and the man Norden Lund, seeing their expressions change from incredulity to a startled acceptance. Pierre Eglin was beside himself. A woman's fur coat entranced him. Quite ordinary cheap fur, but from a species of animal that Keniston realized must have been extinct for millions of years. Cloth and leather became treasures unimaginable in his eyes. He talked incessantly, feverishly, pointing out this wonder and that to his companions, lapsing occasionally into his painful English to ask Keniston some questions. And when he saw an automobile, he became perfectly hysterical with excitement. The automobile was of interest to them all. Varn Allen and Norden Lund stopped to examine it and Gore Hall, gently disengaging himself from his burden of children, joined them. The furry one's quick eye apparently divined where the motive power was hidden away, and he made signs to Keniston that he wanted to see inside. Keniston lifted the hood. Immediately all four bent over to inspect the motor, and the crowd of Middletowners laughed to see the big tame pet animal imitating its masters. The star folk talked, in their swift unfamiliar tongue, and Norden Lund pointed to the engine assembly with the same half-mocking wonder that a man of Keniston's day might have felt toward an ox-cart. 
Gore Hall spoke to Piers Eglin, and the little man turned to Keniston. "'So beautiful! So primitive!' he whispered, and clasped his hands. "'They ask you, make it... make it...' He was stumped for a word, but Keniston got his meaning. The keys were in the lock. He started the motor. Gore Hall was fascinated. There was a good bit of talking, and then the last cupful of gas in the tank ran out, and the motor died. The star folk looked at each other, and nodded, and went on. Mayor Garris was now in his finest form. He had lost his terror of Gore Hall in his pride and his excitement. He showed the strangers from the stars the means by which New Middletown had been made livable. He babbled about its government, its schools and courts, the distribution of food. How much of it the strangers got through Pierre Eglin's stumbling translations, Keniston could not know. But an unreasoning resentment was growing in him. For he and all the folk of Middletown shared Garris' pride. They had had a hard time, and they had taken this alien city, and with their own hands and ingenuity, they had made a functioning decent habitation out of it, and they were proud of that. And all the while they were being proud, the strangers peered at the gasoline pumps and the improvised water system and the precious electric lights that had cost such labor, and were appalled at the crudity and ignorance of these things. They did not need to say so. It was plain in their faces. Presently they stopped and conferred at some length among themselves. Evidently they reached a decision, for Piers Eglin turned and spoke. We have seen enough for this time, he said. Later, and here he trembled with eagerness and his eyes shone moistly like a hound's, later we will wish to see the old city, which you say still stands. But now Varn Allen says we will return to the ship to report what we have found to Government Center. Listen, said Keniston urgently, we need help, we need power and our fuel is running low." Hubble, who had been nearby through all the visit of the strangers, nodded and said, "'If you could start up some of the atomic generators here—' Piers Eglin turned at once to consult Varn Allen, who glanced at Keniston and Hubble and nodded. Piers Eglin said, "'Of course. She says you should be made as comfortable as possible while you are still here. The crew of the Thanis will help. We will work under Gore Hall, who is our chief atomic technician." The mayor gasped. "'That furry brute a technician?' Piers Eglin cleared his throat. "'There will be others among the crew. They will be strange to you. But they are also friends. You had better assure your people.' Garris gulped and said, "'I'll attend to it. I will act as—yes, interpreter. And now there is much to be done. I will return shortly, with the crew and the necessary, uh, objects." The Star Folk left then, going back as they had come, through the portal and out across the dusty plain. And as they went, Mayor Garris gave the news to the crowd. Power, more water, more lights, perhaps even heat. The wild, jubilant cheering startled the still heights of the towers, and the dome rang with it, and underneath that cry of joy Hubble said to Keniston, "'What did he mean, while we were still here?' Keniston shook his head. A cold doubt was in him, almost a foreboding, and it was based on nothing that had been said or done but simply on the realization of the abyss that separated the civilization of old Middletown from civilization that had gone out among the stars so far and so long ago that Earth was almost forgotten. He wondered how well those two incredibly disparate cultures were going to understand each other. He stood for a long while, wondering, watching the crowd disperse, and even the thought that soon the big generators would be humming again could not dispel his worry. End of chapter 10